Welcome to episode two of Expat Chat. Uh, we received a lot of good commentary and a lot of good feedback from the first episode, so we're looking forward to re ramping this up and you know, setting out quite a bit of content that's just going to help you make informed decisions. One thing that occurred to me, James, is those who are watching it on YouTube get the little disclaimers that pop up the bottom. Yes. But those who listening. are listening Nothing. don't see the pop-ups. No. So just for those who are listening on uh, on the podcast, we do need to give a disclosure to say that this information is general in nature. Yes, that's right. And uh, you should not use it as personal advice. Definitely speak to a licensed financial planner and or accountant. Yes. Um, should you have any questions. Absolutely. So um, episode two, what are we talking about today? Well, today we're going to talk about, uh, I suppose, first off in the news last week, a huge decision came out uh, from the Australian court about overruling the ATO. It's the Harding case. Yes. Yep. Uh, tax residency, Bahrain. And then also just briefly touching base on, uh, I suppose, Board of Taxation. They want to overhaul the uh, tax residency rules just because that piece of legislation is from back 1936. Yep. So ridiculous in this day and age. The times have changed and... Uh... Yeah, you know, the, it's amazing these days when you look at the way the legislation works. Yeah, I would hazard a guess to say seventy percent of the professions that people actually work in these days as an expat didn't exist back in nineteen thirty six. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's it's all about global mobility these days, and back then that wasn't really a big a big thing on the list. So, That's right. Um, I suppose some other things that we'll briefly touch yep. base on. I've got a few questions that a few people have submitted. Okay, I'm gonna throw it out to both of us. Um, yep. just provide our own guidance. Yes. And then I suppose we'll, we'll get a character there. Okay, let's get the show on the road. So uh, first topic, the Harding case. Yeah, so uh, as we all know, a brief summary of the Harding case. Um, engineer based over in Bahrain, um, was working obviously in Saudi Arabia. Um, his work put him up in um, service department accommodation, I believe. Yep. Um, his family hadn't moved over there yet because the long-term plan or the short-term plan, I should say, was he'd go over, he'd stay in these service departments um, and then the wife and family would come over once the uh, the youngest child had finished high school, so that was in the next year or two. Um, and then they you know look at getting a permanent rental um, and being there permanently. Um, throughout that period, um, there was a relationship break- breakdown between mm-hmm. the wife uh, and the husband, or Glenn, and essentially they didn't come over. And then in the two thousand eleven, I believe it was uh, income tax year, that's when the ATO chose to challenge his tax residency. Um, ended up saying, listen, you owe us this, huge tax bill. He challenged it, went through the AAT, and then obviously kicked it upstairs again. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, obviously it's been in the background for a long time now, and finally a win, the expats. Look, it's amazing how three little letters, place of abode, oh. can not only have massive ramifications for Mr. Harding, mm-hmm. but expats in general, because the, one of the commentary that, you know, pieces of commentary that I saw um, from the ATO was their expectation that he was going to buy a place. Yes. Now, very few expats actually buy when they're overseas. Not at all. Perm- but, they, but they could be overseas for 20 years. Well, that's right, but they're never, they're usually in some form of temporary accommodation. They're renting, they're leasing, they're, they're not buying a permanent place of a boat, a domicile establishing, yes. all those sort of things. Um, just because usually it's quite complex when you're in another country. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, depending on what visa you're on, you know, there's all these complexities where the ATO doesn't factor it in. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, he was permanently over there. Mm-hmm. You could almost say that that service department building was his permanent place of abode. Yeah. It's no, like, look, I mean, the, the ATO made a big play on the fact that the guy could put all his belongings in a suitcase and move from apartment to apartment. That's right. But the number of belongings you have should not define your tax residency status. No. You know, mm-hmm. if you're a hoarder, yeah, you get more stuff. But mm-hmm. if you're, these days, uh, minimalistic, mm-hmm. this is the, is the term, yeah, you know, right. people love to have that freedom to be able to move around. Yeah. So, you know, to me, it's, it's not so much the fact that he's got a suitcase, but more so where he's living at the time and the duration and he's, do his behaviours match that of a uh, Bahraini mem- yeah. uh, resident? Yeah. Because, you know, he went to the pub, joined the gym, all these sort of things. He didn't purchase a car. Yes. So, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. He, the, char- the characteristics that he had, they did mimic someone that was permanently there. You don't just go and buy a, a car for no reason. Yeah. Um, I think that the ATO also lent on some of the uh, issues with the service department that he wasn't paying any utility bills or anything like that, so hadn't really, uh, I suppose, permanently rooted himself in that community. Yep. Uh, and you're right, I mean, he could pack up his suitcases in hours, yep. which, you know, they hung their hat on as well. They did, but, you know, apart from 2011, which is the year that they assessed him, because he came back and spent quite a bit of time in Australia going through the divorce. Yeah. 
So that was the only way that was what they were sort of leveraging on was, oh, yeah. no, you're in Australia and you're spending this time overseas, but, you know, you've only been overseas for a short amount of time, mm. relatively speaking. Yeah. And, you know, you're back in Australia now, so you're a resident again. Whereas, you know, as the Administrative Appeal Tribunal found, you know, he had to come back to sort out his stuff anyway. And that coming back to sort out his divorce did not um, change his intent, mm. which was to be a foreign resident. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, they could, well, I suppose the ATO was also looking at his family being back in Australia. And, yeah. I mean, I know that's not technically a test when it comes to the four tests that we look at, or the, the, the three main ones, that obviously the last is super for seconded government employees, but um, having or maintaining those close like, family ties, mm -hmm. it's not an actual test. No. But the ATO likes to, you know, hang their hat on this because it's been in past cases as well. It sort of falls under the behaviours, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly right. And... That's what's annoying about residency, and whenever it comes in the courts, they hang their hat on past cases. So yeah. that's why this case is a huge win. Yes. Because it's going to change the way, I suppose, the ATO thinks about residency, and I suppose that's why... We've got a precedent now. Exactly right. Yeah. And I suppose that's why the um, Board of Taxation yeah. uh, wants to overhaul it. You know, they want to remove the full test. They want to have, uh, you know, a primary and then a secondary. Um, and I suppose they're almost just rewriting the rules, but essentially the first test that they're looking at is uh, a day count. Yep. Uh, and it's based on you know, inbound, outbound, all these other things, which would be a lot easier. So straight 183 and, and off we go. Yeah, one thing which is interesting about what they've stated is that it's based within a 12-month period. At the moment, the 183 day rule applies to a financial year period. Yep. So it's going to be interesting to see how that's going to actually interact. So, you know, looking at a calendar year, mm. you know, yeah. It's obviously a new, new fresh financial year, so it has reset, that reset the counter. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And I mean, if you look at, I mean, we had that uh, the webinar the other day. Yep. Um, the way that uh, the US has that substantial yeah, basis. Yeah, couldn't believe that. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was very. Yeah. So it's one eighty three days, but from previous three year period. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So you could, uh, and I think this is where a lot of people, to me, the 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 alarm bells flashed. Yes. When we were talking about. Green cards. Yes. You know, a lot of Aussies want to get green cards. Mm. They want to live the American dream. They have to go into America to set and start that process. Mm. But quite often, then they fly back to Australia, and then they'll sort their life out. They may be back in Australia for you know for a significant period of time. Yeah. But the count has already started. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. So you know, it, it's one of those things. I think that um, I don't know. I mean, to me, the government doesn't do enough to really paint a black and white picture. Whether the ATO does this on purpose to leave themselves some... Oh, some wiggle room. Wiggle room, Why yeah. Why not? Absolutely. You know, it gives them the opportunity. Yeah, because I mean, I think, you know, we speak to a lot of experts and they say, no, no, I went onto the ATO website and filled in the questionnaire. The tool, yeah, the catch-up. Yeah, yeah. And it says I'm a non-resident. But Mr. Harding could have done that. He would have got the same answer. Yeah. Yet the ATO has turned around to try and charge him. Mm. Uh, not charge him, but, you know, bill him as a, uh, as a resident, Australian resident for tax purposes. So... It's, you know, certainly the Board of Taxation changes would be a welcome change because, you know, I mean, to me, there's a lot of, uh, in, you know, in the last five years, mm. digital nomads. Yeah. You oh, know, yeah. They're, they're freelancers, they're Huge. sitting on a beach in Bali, then they might move to this country, this country, but, you know, certainly they would not be considered as a, as a foreign resident. No. You know, and even the Board of Taxation said it in their, their release. They actually talked about um, if that's the case, then even if you're in Bali sitting on a beach, you'll actually still be an Australian resident. Yeah, yeah. Well, because it's usually because they haven't actually established a tax residency in Bali. Exactly. They're over there living that lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, obviously, yeah, there's a big entrepreneurial, you know, I suppose community over there. People start self starters, but they're not paying tax in Bali at all. They've no. just gone over there because you know they can access cheap um, materials and those sort of things to set up these online stores and everything. Yep. But you're right. I mean, the business is still based here in Australia. They still still set up a company, so they're still getting taxed here. I think uh, a little while ago, Estonia released that e-residency. Yes, that was smart. Yeah. Yeah, trying yeah. to target those quote sort of nomads where they're travelling around, but trying to help them establish some sort of tax residency somewhere. But yeah, you still got to um, tick relevant boxes to meet that criteria. You've got to you've got to put your suitcases down somewhere. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and if you're moving from country to country every thirty days. Yeah. Um, because that's how long the visa allows you to be in that country for, mm, mm. then to me, um, yeah, you're not a foreign resident for anywhere. No. And, you know, a similar sort of profession would be super yacht crews. Yes. You know, they, they've, they've got a lot of problems because they can't get a lease in their name, which is what the ATO likes to see. Yeah. 
you know, there's no lease, there's no utility bills, mm. there's no gym memberships. Yep. These guys just sort of orbit the planet on the oceans. Well, that's right. I mean, they're usually in international waters or the you know, Bahamas, Cam- yep. you know, Cayman Islands, all those sort of places where they're not technically establishing a permanent domicile. Obviously, they're working, living on the boat, but where's their tax residency? Because a lot of those type of crews, they get paid cash or yep. they just get you know, US dollars you know, yep. automatically sent to them in their bank accounts. Um, if they haven't gone somewhere and established a tax residency, whether it be in a low tax environment or whatever, then they're still an Australian tax resident. Um, and this That's is where right. a lot of them get caught out. Yep. Um, you know, they'll go overseas for years, they won't do anything about Australian tax returns or anything like come back, speak to a tax agent that has some experience and go, holy crap, mm. like you've got five years of tax returns and it's likely that the ATO is going to want to tax you on every year of that tax-free income. Yep. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of people get quite nervous and they, they just, they're almost scared to seek advice. Yeah, I've actually got one client who um, emailed me last week Yep. and sick of super yacht crew in the Caribbean, Yep. sick of the unknown. Yep. He's actually engaged a tax attorney Yep. Uh, in Australia to get a definitive you know, answer and I'm guessing he'll probably go for a private ruling Yep. just to try and get that peace of mind. Cause you know, I've seen some clients, what they'll do is they'll go and um, rent an apartment somewhere. Yep, heard it. A very cheap apartment, mm-hmm. you know, so they've done a cost-benefit equation to say, okay, if I get assessed for tax, I owe this much, mm. or I can go rent an apartment for this much, yeah. and therefore, you know, yes, I'm not, I am don't have as much take-home, but I'm sort of removing that uncertainty. Yeah. So, you know, certainly you'd love to see the new uh, non-residency laws to take that into account. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean... I think one big question mark is for the FIFO workers. Yes. I yeah. mean, I mean the amount of inquiries we get from FIFO workers about this. I'm heading overseas. I'm I'm working six weeks on, three weeks off. Uh, you know, what are you doing in those three weeks? Oh, I'll probably come back to Australia, catch up with family, friends. Oh, I might travel the three weeks. Okay, well, you know, when you're working, is it just sort of a case where you're staying in the, the camps, the dry camps, essentially? Yep. Yeah. Um, if you're going to establish a new tax residency, you need to do it somewhere and permanently, obviously, yeah. and paying tax there as well in that yep. local jurisdiction. Um, and I suppose, yeah, I mean, that's one thing that's not unclear. I mean, people opt into these FIFO roles because they're like, oh, geez, no tax. Mm. Like, I'm not going to get tax here. You know, if I'm obviously working in other countries, it's likely the relevant tax will come out of it from that yep. employer, which is good. But still, they sort of do it under the premise where, you know, I don't have to pay tax in Australia. Yeah. Not the case at all. They're going to get taxed through the roof still. And I, and I think the other thing too is, um, unfortunately, a lot of these people get told incorrect information by the employers. Oh, yeah. And I mean, even at local barbecues, yeah. pe- people they're even working with on the rigs. Yep. They, oh, I'm a non-tax resident. There's, they obviously they haven't done their own research. That's right. It's likely they still are. Or if they're saying that, it's mean because they've gone to great lengths to make sure they aren't. And That's right. you know, establishing a permanent residence somewhere else. Somewhere else, yeah. Whether it be Thailand, Vietnam, yep. anywhere, all those sort of areas. And look, it's, it's little things done simply, done correctly, mm. that give you the best results. But it's, it's that sort of, I guess, the apathy that a lot of expats sometimes treat the finance side. Yeah. And then they're the yeah. first ones to whinge, when in actual fact, just having a chat to someone who deals with it on a daily basis in two minutes mm. could give them an answer straight away and it would almost solidify the benefits of becoming an expat. Yeah. As opposed to, I'm moving overseas to save money, and then you get a hit with the tax bill, and actual fact, all the pain, the suffering, and the hassles of doing it mm. wasn't worth going to. No, not at all. And I think a lot of people, they'll take that job, they'll take that role if they can make sure that they are an expat. Yeah. I've had, an, I've had inquiries before saying, listen, I want to become a non-resident. What do I need to do? Yep. I was like, well, what are you willing to do? Yeah. I was like, what lengths are you willing to do? Are you willing to go away for a three to five year period you know, almost cut all ties from Australia. Oh, you've got, you know, you've got a main residence right now. Are you willing to rent that out? Oh, I just bought it. No, oh, I don't know if I want to rent it out. I want a tenant destroying it. Yeah. Or you're maintaining a domicile. Yeah. So you're not going to be able to satisfy that test. Therefore, it's likely you'll still be an Australian tax residence. All these things come into it. Yeah. And you're right. Speaking to someone that's obviously knows what they're talking about, an expert yeah. is going to go a long way compared to, um, you know, speaking to someone where it's John Smith's tax returns for ninety eight dollars a year. I mean, we had that case the other day with that um, that accountant. Was it the new client got told uh, by the accountant he's got an investment property, doesn't have to lodge tax returns? Oh yeah, yeah. So um, one of the, one of the questions actually I was going to throw out today is, um, so had an inquiry, been over since since two thousand eleven, um, crystallised essentially their non residency from twenty twelve. Um, they were doing some tax returns, they've got an investment property, some shares going on in the background, 
2015, tax accounts said, listen, you don't need to lodge tax returns because you're a non-resident now. He's been doing their tax returns and knows they have an investment property, producing income, shares that are unfranked, so obviously that needs to be declared. Yep. Uh, but he said to him, you don't need to lodge t- tax returns. So they haven't. I mean, we're coming up wow. to the, the close yeah. of 2019 financial year. Four years later. Yeah, I, I did a quick analysis. I said, listen, it sounds like your property's possibly geared. It's going to be some tax to pay. Um, and, you know, it sounds like you honestly just got poor advice. And yeah. it could be a case where that account does not have exposure to international matters. Yep. You don't want to be paying someone to go and learn what to do. You want to pay someone, you know, that knows what they're knows doing. Knows what they're doing, that's exactly. right. Yeah, rather than, I'll be back in a week and here's the bill for me researching the yeah. answer. Exactly. And it sounds like that was a, a you know, typical case, which unfortunately a lot of people are exposed to. Yep. Um, but now, you know, they're going to have to do a catch up of, four financial years essentially yep. uh, and have a bit of a tax bill to pay which you know, they never would have had to if they went and sought the right advice got the right tax strategy in place all these other things well that's, that's, that's the sad thing to me is they actually did the right thing by getting advice it was just the wrong advice yeah yeah, you're right So, and I think it's something we could you know, certainly address on, on later podcasts you know how does an expat or a soon to be expat select their investment professionals you know, oh, yeah. accountants, you know, financial planners, and those sort of things. Because yeah. even if you you're, you think you're doing the right thing, sometimes it's not the right thing because you talk to the wrong person. Yeah, and I mean, a simple question that can mm. ask these individuals is, how many clients do you have in my current situation? Yep. Do you have many clients in this situation? Do you have many clients on your books that are non-residents? Yeah. Simple questions like that. And if they come back to you, oh, you know, I think I've got one or two. Yeah. Bit of a red flag. It's when they say a couple. They, yeah. they, they never really... Yeah, yeah, yeah. About a couple. Yeah. yeah, I've got a couple. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. You know, you need to really press on this because you want to make sure you're getting the right advice. Yeah. And sometimes it could be a case where that individual just wants to keep it as a client. Yep. It's a revenue stream. Yeah. You know, and then that's why their responses are going to be sometimes a bit grey. Yep. They're keeping you on board. They're getting, obviously, their revenue, but, you know, they're keeping what they think, you know, within the red and yellow flags, but usually, in this case, it was completely yeah. wrong. Well, we've had that case with um, uh, one of the largest dealer groups of financial planners who we won't name names because, yep. once again, we're not keen on getting sued for defamation or those sort of things. No. Not, not that I think we would, but, you know, this group actually bans people from dealing, uh, financial planners from dealing with expats yeah. as soon as they move overseas. And, you know, from the letter of the law inside the dealer group, mm-hmm. they must cease to stop working with these, these clients. Yeah. But what they try and do to circumvent the the process is they will get the client to sign a power of attorney or a limited power of attorney mm-hmm. to someone locally so they say, no, no, I'm still dealing with you know Fred Smith but via his sister. Yeah. The problem is the problem's not solved because no. they're not able to provide advice while that person is overseas. Mm. Especially no. if they're going to places like United States where the rules are so convoluted that you know, eight years in and we're still still finding new ones. Oh, well, I mean, the webinar alone yesterday with Glenn Irons, I mean, that was eye-opening to, yeah. to, to myself even, because, you know, we're the one connected, here, but, you know, Glenn can go on, obviously, several tangents about different things regarding US tax, and yeah. uh, some of them were, mind, you know, mind-boggling. I mean, the, ro- the loan rebasing loan, that's, that's a scary one. Yeah. And just to, just to sort of explain to all the people listening and also viewing, yep. um, on our, both our podcast and YouTube channels, we actually had that live webinar recorded up on those channels. So on podcasting, it's uh, Ask an Expert, mm. and uh, on YouTube, it's under our webinars playlist as well too. But, you know, most experts have loans, whether yep. it's hex debt, whether it's property, whether it's all those sort of things. And, you know, virtually what Glenn was saying was, you know, if you pay it your loan, prepare for a tax bill by the IRS. If you refinance, yeah, prepare for a tax bill. Foreign currency capital gain. That's right. Um, so, I mean, just on more on that webinar, it's mainly geared towards Aussies in the US. Yes, that's that's a big distinction. It's, it's pretty much, yeah, if you're in Hong Kong, Singapore, Dubai, London, um, yeah, go watch something else more exciting on YouTube or listen on on, uh, on podcasts. Well, I suppose we'll, we'll do another one of those, but yeah. for everyone, but that's going to be probably after the tax year. Yes. Um, with Shane McFarlane, so that's okay. But yep. yeah, no, exactly right. Ro- loan rebasing, foreign currency, capital gain, IRS, worst taxation authority in the world. I think Amazing. we can all agree. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing that, you know, it's great talking to Glenn and it's great talking to all these people we're going to talk to through the year. You know, the Ask, ask an Expert uh, webinar series is virtually going to be us interviewing key people that we work with on a daily basis but these people 
do this stuff every single day. Yeah. And that's the big distinction. When you're looking at working with um, some sort of professional, whether it's immigration, uh, tax, law, um, insurance, you name it, don't just assume that person has that experience and has that um, understanding of the implications. You know, because that's the first thing we do when we meet people is one we've heard, heard the brief. We go straight away, okay, here's the red flags. Yeah. How do we fix that? And then we step it back and say, okay, now we fix the red flags. How do we maximise the financial benefits of your moving overseas? Yeah, exactly right. Start creating wealth in obviously you know a, a tax efficient manner or as, as much as we can, um, and obviously not causing those adverse CGT events on the other side as well. So yep. you know trying to work on both sides, but keeping it locally yeah. um, to Australian assets. But just moving and touching base on the US side because yes. you brought it up. Yep. I did have an inquiry that. Did raise a question. Yeah, go for it. I yep. thought I'd bring it in. Yep. Um, there's a bit of a gap in what we know, but I'll try and read it out. So, bit of a background. I'm 57. I'm an Australian citizen. I'm living in the US permanently on a green card. I'm married to an American citizen. Um, I've got a super fund in Australia, standard retail super fund, just for a background. Also got a 401k accruing with my current employer. I'm not coming back to Australia. I'm going to retire in the US. So that's the background. Um, question is, what should I do with my Australian super account? A, let it continue in accruing value as I work full-time in the US. So that's the first question. Yep. So, you know, let it accrue value. Um, he's not retired yet, obviously. No, still working, right. so you can't really pull it out. You can't, yeah, you've got no choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So B, I mean, a bit of a side note, um, since N, um, super fund does not have a reciprocal fund in the US, I might just pause on that one. Yep. So just for a bit of background for everyone, you can't directly transfer a 401k into an Australian super fund. That's right, yeah. And vice versa, you can't transfer an Australian super fund amount lump sum directly into a 401k. They're completely different um, tax vehicles, essentially. And one's then, a pension, one's a social security. Well, that's right. Yeah. And, I mean, the tax treatment is completely different. Um, 401ks generally, well, there's types of 401ks, the Roths, the IRAs, but generally a 401k from your employer, it's a tax deferred account. Yep. You know, salary sacrificing, matching scheme, no one's paid tax on it, the contribution that have gone in, it grows. When you pull it out, that's when you start getting taxed. Yep. Superannuation's different. When it goes in, the contributions go in from us, there's, you know, there's obviously after-tax contributions, the non-concessional, and then the concessional, which is from us mm -hmm. or the employer. Yep. From salary sacrificing. So when that goes in, the 15% tax goes in. The investments are taxed at the 15% or long-term capital gains, 10%. And then when we're 60 or over, we're fully retired, draw any country, tax-free. Yep. So completely different to the 401k system. So no, you can't directly transfer super into obviously 401k and vice versa. That's just addressing that question. Um, and then lastly, he said, is, is there, well, he's asking if there's another super fund that has a reciprocal in the US. Yep. There isn't. Yeah, there isn't, yep. There isn't completely different management treatment. Um, to allow me to retirement fund and minimize the costs, um, how would you advise me to access my Australian super fund? So, that's a bit of a broad question, but essentially I think he's asking, one question that doesn't get asked there is, how's his Australian suit funding treated right now by the IRS? Yeah. The fact that he's retiring the US, and if he starts drawing this income stream from the Australian super fund, he's gonna to have to report it to the IRS. And that's, that, that's, that's the bit that causes a lot of confusion, because when you go from a accumulation account to a allocated pension super, mm -hmm. in Australia, you don't pay tax. So in allocated pension, no capital gains tax, uh, no income tax. Yes. However, so people go, okay, great, free money. Yeah, yeah. But the US actually tax you on that if you're drawing down the minimum 4%, that 4% oh, yeah. becomes Absolutely. Uh, accessible for tax in the US. And there's not usually a tax credit either. That's right. Because it's tax-free money when we're drawing it from the Australian yeah. side. So one area that is a bit, I suppose, nerve-wracking is, okay, you're gonna start drawing this income stream, you're gonna start still carrying it on your IRS tax returns as foreign sourced income, there's no tax credit there available. If you haven't declared it to the IRS, is the IRS gonna to wanna to know more about that super fund and that balance mm -hmm. and be like, well, where's this amount come from? We've never taxed the growth of it. It's suddenly popped up on the, on the radar. And, yeah. yeah, that's right. As we know, you know, you, you know, super funds can be foreign grantor trusts, they can be employees trusts. Yeah. Yep. Uh, sorry, employee benefit trusts, um, case by case, yep. has been established yesterday based on the contributions and other things. But that's a big red flag in itself. 
has been treated right now. If he's declaring it, good. If it's obviously he's declaring the capital growth and the earnings and he's paying tax on that now, that's good because when he draws from it, he's not going to get taxed again. Yep. But it's almost the flip side. Look, it is, yeah. 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 And I think that's where, you know, people really struggle, expats in the US in particular, how to join the dots because quite often there's apples and oranges mm-hmm. and they try to make them apples and apples. Yep. And, uh, you know, to me, it's... People really need to realise, you know, these schemes, the 401k superannuation, you know, they've been going for 30, 40 years. Yep. Now, the the idea of cross-border migration of assets really wasn't a big thing back in the 70s and 80s. No, not at all. So these things were set up in isolation separately. Yep. But, and that's why they don't match. Yeah. You know, as opposed to Australia and the UK pension scheme. Mm. Australia borrowed a lot of the parts to build super, uh, but then flipped it around. So yeah. instead of being tax-free accumulation in Australia, you tax on accumulation. Yeah. And the UK, you pay tax in um, pension phase, whereas yeah. in Australia, you don't pay tax. So you know that's why there's that's the only avenue to move um, your pensions or allocated pensions superannuation between UK and Australia mm. is because there is. A similar structure. Yeah, I'll put that in inverted commas. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I think you, if you keep going further, you're going to start talking about the foreign super fund. And obviously, you know, if you're working over in say the Asia region, provenant fund, um, you know, trying to withdraw that within the six month period before you, you know, as you return to Australia, that's obviously yep. when you want it. Um, and the fact that you've been a non residency means you're going to get that six month tax free grace period. Yeah. Options around trying to get into super, but obviously staying within your, your contribution yeah. caps. Um, obviously, you need to look into a you know, relevant strategy there. Um, and it's it's rare that normal retail or industry super funds will accept those contributions. That's right. Um, it's usually a case where, or it's, I'd say it's, I don't know, I don't even know if any exists now, but whether you can do a direct transfer, it's usually you can't now. You, well, that's why, I mean, I think, you know, there was about three or four, I think, local government superannuation was, like, there was a couple of weird ones yeah, yeah. that um, accepted, but you had to be working for the local government. Yeah. be part of that fund. So, yeah. I mean, even the ones that were there weren't usable by Australian experts. Mm. The other problem you've got too is with contribution caps being reduced and proposed to be further reduced... Oh, with labour. With labour. Yeah. You're going from 100 down to 75. Yeah. Even if... And a lot of experts don't actually understand the six-month rule. So, just to explain that quickly for the audience. Yep. Essentially, you move back to Australia, you have six months to move your foreign pensions back into the country... Mm-hmm. And you might pay tax. Just further on that, you've yeah. got to make sure before that period you were a non-resident. Yes, that's correct, yeah. Um, I'm going to just do a little side note and story. Had yep. a recent inquiry about an individual that's been working over in Papua New Guinea, I think a gold mine. Okay. Um, and he's actually still been an Australian tax resident for the last 10 years. So he's been declaring that income here in Australia, paying tax on it. But unfortunately, he is a Papua New Guinea and super fund accumulating as well through this employer. Has he declared that to the... He, he should have been declaring the growth of it each year. Yep. That way he can withdraw it. Yes. However, he hasn't been. The fund has grown quite large now, and because he's never been a non-resident, there's no six-month grace period for him at all. That's right, yeah. So you need to then go down the path of seeking a private ruling yep. to ident- identify with the ATO what is taxed and what is untaxed. Yep. And then that way, when you transfer it back, you'll know how to declare it in your Australian tax return. Yep. Um, that was a side note, sorry. Okay. No, that's good. Then. And look, that's half the battle, I think, that expats you know, when they leave the country and when they come back, yes. you know, quite often they're, they're not considering financial considerations. Not at all. And they, no. they're coming back to Australia, they, they're looking forward to moving into the new house or living with family or, you know, getting back to Australian roots. Yep. The problem you've got is they don't know about the six-month rule and, you know, like a lot of Australians with Australian super accounts, a lot of Australian expats have pension accounts sort of dotted as yeah. they've moved around in the years. If they don't move those pension accounts back into Australia in that six-month period, then any change in value from that point on becomes taxable. Yeah, well, it becomes applicable fund earnings. Yes. Um, so essentially, when you bring it back, let's run a little quick scenario. Yep. I've left it there for two years. The markets have had a great one in that two-year period since I've been back. I take it out. I finally work out how to take it out. Um, you know, the balance of that fund before I left, that's not taxable, which is good. But the applicable fund earnings is essentially the growth of that fund since I've been back. That's yes. 100% taxable. Yep. If you bring it straight back in your individual name, putting in your bank account, that growth needs to be declared in your Australian tax return. Yep. Um, the accountant is likely to declare it as foreign sourced income. It's likely there's not going to be a tax credit there either. 
Um, so depending on your cash flow, you could have a you know very big tax bill and be a bit surprised. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that's how that's treated, uh, and that's a bit of a scenario on yeah foreign super fund transfers. But like I said, there's not too many retail super funds exist these days, and usually people might have to consider going and getting around of a self managed super fund. Yep. Yeah. Because there's a lot more control there if you're working with an accountant that can do so. But obviously, it's not worth it if um, you know if your balance is going to be under. Call it 500 grand. You so, know, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, with at, the least, said, yeah. at least, at least. Yeah. I mean, I don't like seeing that more, you know. Oh, when you see the 100, 200,000 on a self managed super fund. Shouldn't have it, shouldn't yeah. have it. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's a you know, general bit of a rundown there, but I'll move on to this next question. Yes, go for it. Yeah. It's very unusual. Yep. Um, so, I was told by my, my accountant that in order to be a non resident, we must be away from Australia for a minimum of seven years. We can't send anything home in terms of funds or savings. Is this correct? Where did the seven years from? Oh, that's what I sort of walked out as well. Yeah. That means if you reference a six year, you might be referring to MRE or, or those sort of things, but seven years. Seven years, that's such a, a random number. I know. And uh, it, I mean, almost second guess myself for a second because mm. I was like, I've never heard of a seven year rule. Yeah. What don't I know? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. What don't I know? Yeah. So um, had a quick chat to an accountant and they told me there is no seven year rule. I was like, yeah, I thought I was right. Okay. Yep gone back to him and said there is no seven year rule. Mm. Now it, it's possible that this account is ultra conservative, yep. saying, listen, you need to stay away. You need to stay for a good time, yep. you know, at least seven years. Yep. That's the period, that's that's the- So the account may have referenced a random number to give the idea behind how how, how long you need to go for. Yeah. And this guy took it as the letter of the law, yeah, yeah. have to wait for seven years. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that he's like, you know, don't send any money home, can cut yep. ties. Um, I think that's probably, the guy's probably getting to a point where he's like, I want to come home, but I don't want to come back in the six year mark and it sort of trigger a, a tax residency event where mm-hmm. they're going to look at me for the last six years. So, you know, there is no seven year rule. Yeah. Um, obviously, case by case, based on your circumstances, satisfying all those tests, you know, as a minimum, you know, I say to um, people, you know, a minimum of three years. Yeah. I mean, that's a comfy range. Com- yeah, and, and the interesting thing, you know, just referencing it, the Harding case again. Yeah. So um, for those out there who are really bored, you can actually read the Ministry of Appeals Tribunal's final report that how they were able to throw this case out. Uh, sorry, you know, uh, approve the appeal. Yeah. yeah. And I think it was this, one of the last pages, um, the judges actually referenced the fact that the whole premise, because what they, they're really getting, really nitpicking with Mr. Harding. Yeah. And they said he's got super in Australia and he's got investments in Australia. Yeah, okay. And, well, most expats would love to take the super with them, but yeah. they can't. So yeah. that's, yeah. You know, but the, the judges actually said in today's international world, there is an expectation that there will be money moved around and there is a higher expectation that if you are overseas, earning money and want to save it, more than likely you were repatriated back to Australia because yes. you, you know the economy, you know the framework, you know how no protected you are. Yeah. 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 So that was actually great to see that on paper, you know, mm. because you know, we get so many comments from people about this whole do I transfer money back to Australia or not? Yeah. And we say, well, it happens every day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. But it's on the intent of that money. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, do not send money back that looks like a salary. Do not send money yeah. back you know, if you're sending money back to pay for the mortgage, great. If you're sending money back to build up an investment account, great. Almost like a, um, sending it back for an intended purpose, really. Yeah, or, or right. you know, like you said, offset account, mortgage repayments, yeah. expenses for a rental property. Um, I mean, obviously, like you said, I know there'd be plenty of individuals out there who would be getting paid into their Australian bank account from their overseas wage because yeah. that's what's being organised through their account. Or yep. Not through their account, sorry, through the Employer. payroll. Yep. yep. Um, which, if they want to satisfy being a non-resident, that's actually something you should not yeah. do. I mean, yeah. you're in a new country, set up a bank account, do, right. do the right thing. Be a local. Yeah, be a local, exactly right. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I actually had this conversation yesterday with a client. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he's based in China. So, and we're talking about this repatriation of capital. Yeah. And I said to him, I said, okay, you're in Shanghai. Compare yourself to a local Shanghai resident. Yes. Can you buy property in Australia? Yes, you can. Yeah. You know, China's been doing it. A lot of other foreign nationals have been doing it. So that does not you know, mean you're a resident. Can a Chinese investor invest money in the Australian stock market? They certainly can. Absolutely. It's when they start to move money back because of family reasons mm. 
then they go, well, would a Chinese national do that? Yeah. No. Yeah. So, and, and you know, once once I sort of gave them that clarity of saying, you know, pretend you're a local yeah. and act like a local, mm. it's like, ah, oh, okay. Because that's where the confusion is. People go, should I man, you know, transfer money, should I not? But in actual fact, th- you know, if you're in Dubai, think of yourself as an Emirati. If you're in Singapore, what would a Singaporean do? Yeah. You know, if your financial transactions and your behaviours match that of a Singaporean resident, then great. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. No, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there, yeah. absolutely. Um, I've got another question. Go for it, yeah, keep going through. I'll throw him out there. This one's unusual, and um, I don't think there's any issues with this, to be honest, but um, uh, individuals or a uh, wife and a husband, they've been living over in France um, for a period, France again, actually, like the other one. Yep. Um, they stopped working um, in 2016, and then they, they stayed in France. They were still tax residents, but they didn't receive an income, had plenty of savings until um, 2018, then they recommenced work. They wanted to know whether their tax residency has reset um, in that two-year period because they weren't working. Yep. But um, they didn't come back to Australia at all. Yep. So in that case, what would you say? Tax residency reset? No, not no, at all. Not at all. I mean, still non-residents. It's domicile. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the resides test, the domicile test. You know, they're still living in France. Yeah. So, you know, to me, it's, it's not about whether you're earning money or not. A lot of Australians retire overseas. Yeah. And a lot of Australians who lived in Australia the whole life are looking to retire overseas mm. because of the high cost of living. So, Absolutely. you know, it, it comes down to that demarcation, that milestone event, you know, boots on the ground in which country. Yeah. And then what are you doing on the ground? Yeah. You know, are you travelling? Are you living? You know, as long as you're boots on the ground living, then nothing really changes. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, again, nail on the head. I mean, they hadn't actually come back to Australia, still over there two years. Um, you know, it sounds like there was a bit of a passion project going on in the background. Yeah. Um, so they're staying over in France. So, yeah, the fact Renovating that... Renovating a chalet or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah probably, yeah. 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 Um, retirement house and the... Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, just because you're not working and you're still, you know, maintaining your domicile and everything in a foreign country, that, yeah, I mean, it doesn't reset your non-residency or anything like that. You're taxing right. in Australia, you're not bungee back to Australia for tax purposes. Yeah. You're still maintaining there. I mean, just further on that, what about um, a, a scenario where you're moving on to another country, but again, you finish maybe a role in the UAE, yep. Dubai, and then you're lucky enough to pick up a new role in, in um, Singapore, um, but there's maybe a, a two-month gap there where you might do a bit of travel. Yep. So in that situation, would you say that you bungee back to Australia, or would you say, you know, it, because of that short period, yeah. probably you'd still be a known resident actually? Yeah, I think it's, it comes back to, you know, what's reasonable. Yeah. yeah, you yeah. Know, do you have to, do they expect you to move back to Australia for that two-month period and then go back? Yeah, no. Yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, yeah. it's, it's based on your intent. You mm-hmm. know, you, if you can show that you've got a contract that finishes this date yep. and a contract that starts this date, you have to do something. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, are they going to try and tax you on that two-month period when you're not earning money? Well, I mean, no. look, yeah, look at the criteria. The 183 day rule, that's yeah. not getting ticked at all. No. Um, I don't know anyone that can establish a domicile, a permanent domicile in two months. Yep. Um, and then again, you know, obviously resides two months. You know, technically you'll be moving to Singapore from Dubai, so you'll be residing still overseas. Exactly. Still ticking the relevant box for being non resident. Yeah, yep. So there's no issues there. Look, there's not. And I think that's the other thing too that, um, you know, a lot of people don't understand is the moving parts between jurisdictions. Yep. So we're just talking about Australia here. Yeah. But when you throw foreign jurisdictions in, mm. you know, they have their own rules as well too. So, you know, looking at, you know, everything, what, what comes down to, you know, one person will be completely different to another based on the countries they're moving to. Yeah, that's right. You know, going back to the US issue, you know, you, it, all depending on what time of the year you move to the United States. And if you've been there before, mm like we discussed in the webinar, um, will dictate when's a good time to move to the US, whether it's the beginning of the year, the end of the year, you know, the start of the new year. Mm. Um, and it's amazing, these little things, just by having a chat to someone who has half a clue, mm. let alone does this full time, yeah. you can make the most monumental difference yeah. you know, when it comes to making that change work for the better. Yeah. Um, but also to, you know, people you know, moving stressful enough as it is, let alone moving states, let alone moving countries. Mm. Yeah, you know, and then you factor the new, you know, if you're changing employers mm. and, and, you know, there's a lot going on. So, you know, I've always said to clients, get the financial stuff out of the way first. Yeah, absolutely. It's not sexy, it is boring. Yeah. 
But that's why everyone puts it off. Exactly, that's right. Exactly, they want to Google where they're going to live and all that sort of stuff. Try and sort it out once they're over there. Yeah. yeah, but they never do because they get into the local life and then suddenly, you know, twelve months later, and off they go. Yeah. Just you know, it's like doing homework. You know, I've got two daughters. Mm-hmm. You know, seven going on fifteen and ten going on twenty, and I say to them all the time, "Get it out of the way now." Yeah. And then you have all afternoon to chill. Yeah. But sometimes I'll just step back and see if they do it. Of course they don't. No. They go and run around at 8 o'clock at night, we're doing homework, yeah. they're all tired and cranky. You stay on them, yeah, yeah. exactly. So experts are the same. You know, they, you know, the smart ones just get it out of the way done. Yeah. You know, whether it's moving from Australia or moving um, you know, between countries overseas, just those little things just make you know, a monumental difference. Yeah. And suddenly, you know, you make that change, it's all going swell, and you think, wow, that was easy. Because there's no surprises. Yeah. There's none of that, you know, that those issues, and you know, there's so much mis- mis- misinformation out there, um, which is one of the reasons why we started the, you know, the okay. expat chat, mm. because we just got sick and tired of hearing the bar talk and the barbecue talk. Yeah. And clients coming to us with these random, like seven year old, what? You what know, the hell? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where did that come from? Yeah. I, I think I'm going to start a room about the 11 and a half year rule and see if it gets out there, you know. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. talk. You do, you do. So, uh, yeah, folks out there, if you hear about 11 and a half rule, it means it's working. It's come from us, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one thing you mentioned, I mean, about the residency, I mean, what it would, is quite frustrating, every country has different residency rules. I mean, you mentioned the US one. I mean, if you're only arriving there for the first time at the back end of the year, yeah. it's likely that you will be a non-resident for that year that you're arriving right. that calendar year. Yeah. So, you know, if I'm arriving first time ever, September, yeah. I'm not going to be a resident. Yeah. And it's likely that if you seek the right advice over there as well, they're not going to declare you a resident. So, it's um, a good win. Yeah, it is a good win. I mean, it means that income in that calendar year is not going to get captured by the IRS. But yeah. then obviously, 1st of January, boom, boom. you're in, you're on again. You're in yeah. the system. Yeah. Um, obviously, you'll need to do some relevant filings. Yeah. But every country is different. So mm-hmm. it can be a case where you might leave Australia, be a non resident as of this date, but that country you just land in says, oh, hang on, you're actually yeah. a resident of this country, but we're going to look back a few yeah. months before you actually left Australia. That's right, yeah. So that's what's frustrating, and that's yeah. why I suppose expats, they need to get advice. Yeah, that's, that's right. And it's just, it, you know, it's amazing a 15 minute chat, just, you know, not even going into the details, just mm. having that 40,000 foot general chat, this is what I'm looking at doing, you know, what's the red flags? Yeah. You know, and suddenly they know it. Now, they can either address it or they don't, mm. but at least yet yeah, you're aware of what the implications are of making that move is. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. And I think, yeah, like you said, the 40,000 view. Um, yeah. Okay, you know, you've got these bits and pieces um, going on, you know, have you addressed this yet? Why haven't you lodged your tax return? Is that carrying capital gains tax? Did you deem, deem disposal? Okay, you can do this. So addressing it from the 40,000 view and then obviously getting granular. I mean, yeah. that's the way to go about it. And like you said, I think expats, when they go overseas, yes, this sort of thing, it's the last thing on their mind. They don't want to deal with it because it's stressful. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it's usually a case where they'll look at addressing it maybe after year one or year two. They'll have good intentions. But yeah. yeah. But the more they sort of put it off, the heavier weight it becomes on their shoulders and then yeah. they leave it to a point where it's like, ah, oh, crap, I've got to get something done. Yeah. And then when they speak to a professional, like, shit, probably left some things a bit late here. Yeah. I'm going to be in for maybe a small tax bill. Or... 18 months down the mark, you realise you can't go back in time and make changes. Yeah. Whereas if they just had that quick chat before they went, they could shuffle the deck chair, so to speak, and yeah, position themselves in a far stronger situation yeah. to make the most of where they're moving to. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, the, all the inquiries that I've had, it's a case where it's either an individual that's been overseas for 18 months. It's always the 18 months. It's 18, 12 to 18 months. You can almost see it. It's, it's almost like 18 months is the red flag. It's like, okay, yeah. I've been away for a while now. Yeah. Or I've received this funny letter from my bank about yeah. residency. <laughs> that's <laughs> right, yeah. They're asking for a tin or something like yeah. that. Yep. So, I mean, more on more so on the data feeds and everything getting shared. I mean, I had a client the other day. Um, they've just headed over. Obviously, they've been overseas for six months now. But they received a letter from Commonwealth Bank Australia saying, hey, we realise that you're overseas. Yep. They haven't actually put anything out there that they yeah. are overseas. So it just goes to show that where they're located, that tax system is obviously sharing data with the ATO, which knows the ATO has contacted Commonwealth Bank through yep. you know, the online system and said, hey, this person's overseas. You yeah. might need to update your system. Yep. The letter goes out to the client. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And off we go. Yeah, exactly right. Cool. Yeah. Right, guys, I hope you enjoyed episode two of Expat Chat. One thing I actually want to mention, which is a product we rolled out late last year, yes. which I think is invaluable for expats. Of course, I'm going to say that because yep. we did it. Yep. But quite often people don't need 
the full gamut of financial advice. They no. just need to be aware of the situations. And we rolled out a, a product called a pre-departure review. Yes. Where you're able to go online and um, fill in your details and you'll get a customised report sent back to you within one working day that outlines the key considerations that you need to be aware of. Yes. Um, yeah, charging two ninety five. Yep. Yeah, it's not a small amount, but it's not a massive amount. No, but I mean, further on that, it's usually a case if, if you know, you know if they've done the report, I'm more than happy to go through that report with the master as yeah. well. I mean, they've got all the key information. They've got a lot of the information they need to actually go and update certain things, so yeah. they're not going to get caught out in yep. eighteen months' time. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'm always you know happy going through that report, doing a bit of a consult, and just running through it. Okay, this is what this means if there's anything they don't understand, or they can always just email us. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I think the big thing is, you know, there's little things that make a big difference, like deemed disposal. Yeah. You know, you have that case with a client who wasn't aware of deemed disposal, went overseas, was sitting on shares, they should have, on paper, disposed of them before they left, in which case, all the massive gains, and we're talking Huge. Seven, we're talking seven, seven figures here, guys. Huge. Um, would have been tax-free. Yeah. However, because they didn't get that right advice at the beginning, even though they've been overseas for a long period of time, they will pay capital gains tax for the whole lot. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I mean, in that case, we need to sort of, yeah, yeah, it's a bit of a complex strategy. I it, want, it I is. Into it. Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, certainly, um, if you are recently looking at the pre-departure review, um, you can just Google Atlas Wealth Management pre-departure review mm-hmm. uh, or just go to atlaswealth.com.au and um, if you go to the top where we talk about how we can help, it's the, the first item there on the menu. So... James, thanks very much for uh, joining me again today and uh, look forward to the many more to come. Absolutely. Take care.